Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to the second seminar of the International Year of the Salmon, the IYS seminar series. We're very excited to have you here. My name is Aidan Schubert, and I am the IYS coordinator for the North Pacific region. Uh, I'd like to start by acknowledging that the IYS Secretariat is based on the traditional, ancestral and unceded territories of the Squamish, tsleil and Musqueam First Nations on what is now known as Vancouver, British Columbia. We thank them for their stewardship of these lands and waters that have sustained salmon since time immemorial. Uh, next, uh, next slide, please, Caroline. Thanks. This seminar is one of a seven part series that covers a range of topics uh, related to the IYS high seas expeditions. As we prepare for the international IYS 2022 Pan Pacific winter high seas expedition uh, that will take place early next year. And you'll hear more about that later. You can now register for the entire seminar series on the IYS website as well. Today, we will begin with a presentation by Dr. Laurie Wykamp and Dr. Dick Beamish on the key findings from the 2019 and 2022 expeditions, followed by a panel discussion involving a number of scientists that took uh, part in, in the expeditions that will be led by the IYS High Seas Coordinator, Caroline Graham. And then we will finish with a open question and answer session where Yourselves, the attendees, can uh, pose questions to the panelists either using the Q&A function or by raising your hand and uh, using audio. This seminar will be recorded and will be available on the IYS website uh, uh, by the end of this week, uh, alongside the first seminar uh, recording, which is currently available there too. Uh, so you can pass that information along to any colleagues or friends who couldn't make it today. So before I give the floor over to Dr. Beamish and Dr. Wykamp, I'll provide you with a short introduction to them both. Dr. Beamish is an emeritus scientist with Fisheries and Oceans Canada. He was the main driving force for the International Year of the Salmon Initiative. And alongside Dr. Brian Riddle, he, has, uh, he, raised, he raised funds to successfully conduct the 2019 and 2020 expeditions and has continued to play a leading role in the IYS 2022 Pan Pacific Expedition. Uh, Dr. Whitecant is a research fisheries biologist for NOAA Fisheries in the US and is actively involved in research on salmon in the estuarine and marine waters of the California current and on the high seas. She took part in the 2019 Gulf of Alaska Expedition and is one of the US country leads for the 2022 Pan Pacific Expedition. Brian, I'll hand it over to you. I think you're passing it on to Dick now. Dick, you can start your talk. Thanks, Carolyn. <laughs> yes, that's right. All righty. Well, I just have a, a very brief introduction to, um, to the to both um, both expeditions, and this is all about encouraging uh, international cooperation in, uh, with respect to understanding essentially the mechanisms that regulate Pacific salmon and and, uh, and our future stewardship in a changing ocean and climate condition. So, but this all begins around. 2009. And at that time, Brian Riddle and I met with our colleagues around the North Pacific, and we were putting together a document that uh, summarized the research and monitoring that was going on with the intention, with the intention of finding ways of, of encouraging uh, continued cooperation. Um, I'm not, that's the slide that I'm talking about, just the title. Anyhow, I want to show you the document. This is the document that, that came out of, the, out of the meetings. It was published around October 2009 and tucked away in, the, I think, the last page in the last 
paragraph, I, I suggested that we have an international year of the salmon to demonstrate the importance and the contributions that could be made uh, if, if all countries worked together in terms of the research that they were doing. The, um, that really didn't happen until uh, a few years ago after I retired. But the, the issue now is even more relevant, which is the, the title of this slide. And with the ocean warming events that, that I guess started around 2014, and then with the changes that we've seen in the last five, six, seven years with the, with the, with the a tremendous reduction in, in total catches by all countries in 2020, um, and then again with the historic returns um, of sockeye in Bristol Bay this year, but importantly for British Columbia, with the collapse of our commercial fisheries, the catches in 2019 were only 5% of the catches in the past and 2020 wasn't much better. So the point is that there are changes going on now that are historic in, um, in terms of uh, declines, abrupt changes, variability, and the, the concept of international cooperation and working together as international teams of researchers is even more important than when it was first proposed in 2009. So that's my introduction. So uh, I am now gonna talk a little bit about the results of the expeditions. This figure, the map is showing where we sampled in both years. The gray area shows 2019 uh, covered a really large area. I believe it was 62 stations, largely because we had absolutely fabulous weather. The green and red dots and lines is where they intended to go in 2020, but due to uh, a series of storms, as well as the explosion of COVID and borders closing, the blue dots are where uh, they actually sampled in 2020, which instead of being kind of north-south, ended up being more east-west. Next. And in both years, uh, we did the same three things at every station. First, we did a little bit of physical oceanography by looking at uh, water column properties. We then did zooplankton sampling with uh, bongo or jude nets. And then finally, we used a rope trawl towed at the surface to catch salmon and whatever else would come in the net. And most of the results I'll be showing you here are from the rope trawl. Uh, next. So we have cool zone uh, drone footage showing it from 2020. This is probably during a CTD cast uh, where they hold the ship still. And then this is showing the net uh, being towed behind the boat, which is pretty cool. Nice clear day, clear water. Next. So what I'd like to do uh, as far as results go is start with sea surface temperatures to kind of uh, lay out the, the lay of the land, and then talk a little bit about the salmon results, and then finally end with some of the things that we didn't catch, but were able to detect using environmental DNA. Next. So as far as sea surface temperatures, uh, these graphics are showing temperatures. In the two years, the dashed red lines show the same latitudes in both figures, since the maps are a little bit different. And you can see very clearly that the patterns were very similar between the two years, which is what you'd expect given that there's a strong counter or counterclockwise current going on. So towards the north and the west, it was cold, and to the south and to the east, it was warmer, uh, although the actual temperatures were a little bit different among years. Next. This next figure shows the catch of salmon in 2019. The pie chart shows the distribution by species. Just over half of the 427 salmon that we caught were chum salmon, followed by coho, sockeye, pink salmon, and we even caught three Chinook salmon out there. And the maps just show the distribution of the individual species. You can see that sockeye tended to be caught uh, in the largest numbers further north, 
Coho, especially pink salmon, and to some degree, Chinook were further south, and Chum were widely distributed throughout the study area. But if anything, it, it, they were probably farther west than, than east. Next. This next figure is the same distribution or same pattern except for the 2020 catches. Uh, we caught almost 150 more salmon in 2020 than 2019, due largely to a single large catch that included both chum and pink salmon down in the bottom center of these figures. Um, whether the sockeye or was further north or not, it's again, it's hard to tell because uh, the distribution of the catches, but you can clearly see that there are some differences. It's also notable that almost all the Chinook salmon were caught uh, just on the continental shelf, right off the mouth of the Strait of Juan de Fuca, which is very different than what we saw in 2019, where there, the three fish were uh, quite a ways from shore. Next. One of the interesting questions I had is how are these salmon species distributed relative to each other? For example, if you're looking at the catch of chum salmon uh, on the x-axis compared to all other salmon uh, in the same hull, which is on the right on the uh, y-axis, if these species are segregating each other themselves uh, in the ocean, then you'd expect all the dots to fall in the blue uh, rectangles, or if there was high overlap among species, then you'd expect them in the purple oval. Next. And what we found is that they are actually segregated, even though the, the large scale patterns overlapped, uh, in any one hall, generally one species dominated the catch. And you can see that most of these points are along the axes. One exception is this large catch that occurred in 2020, where we got a lot of chump salmon and pink salmon, but even steelhead, uh, only one steelhead was caught in 2020, and it was the only salmon caught in that haul. Next. And another interesting uh, aspect of, of the work was what they were consuming. Uh, and we saw that there were, the diets varied by species, and they seemed to follow the patterns that you would really expect, given what we know about these uh, different salmon species. So chum, pink, and sockeye salmon are known to be zooplanktivores, and lo and behold, they ate a lot of euphausids, shown in blue, also pteropods in yellow, and then the gray other category, which included a lot of zooplankton. For species that feed a little higher uh, in the food web, namely chinook, coho, and steelhead, they consumed a lot more squid or cephalopods, uh, which is shown in green. And, and surprisingly few fish. Chum also are known for consuming gelatinous material and the purple is uh, the selenerates, which is exactly that. So, uh, but there was some variation uh, among years as well, especially for coho, which ate a lot of pteropods in 2019. Next. Uh, and it's interesting to try and start putting together both the salmon data as well as kind of the biological and, and physical and environmental data to understand kind of what, what are they responding to given their distributions. So for 2019, I'm just showing the distributions of chum, coho, and sockeye. And if you look at, compare where they were versus the temperature, you can see that chum and coho are in warmer waters, sockeye are in cooler waters. Chum and coho also, distributions also map the distributions of squid fairly well, even though neither of those two species consume very many squid. So perhaps all three uh, are consuming the same prey, and that's that's why they were where they were. The coho distributions also match pteropods fairly well, and as I mentioned, in 2019, coho were eating a lot of pteropods. And similarly, the sockeye were distributions mapped pretty well onto euphausa distributions, and that was also an important prey for sockeye. Next. One of the things I found really fascinating is where these fish originated from. Um, so this is the country or state of origin for the fish caught in the study area. So we have Japan, Russia, Alaska, Canada, et cetera, all the way down to California. Chum salmon were the most international, um, going from Japan all the way to Washington, and Chinook the least so. So we, I believe we had one individual in 19 that was from Southeast Alaska, all the rest were from Canada or the state of Washington, including a few fish from California. 
and these uh, globes just show the distribution of the origins of these fish that we caught out in the ocean. And you can see how chum salmon have this very wide, broad uh, map compared to Chinook, which is uh, largely the, the West Coast. Next. And I should say that was all based on genetic data. Uh, one of the other things that I found really interesting is what we didn't catch in the nets. So this is the results of some environmental DNA conducted by Christoph Dieg, where the idea is that every animal sloughs off DNA at all times. And if you filter the water, you can pick it up and see what was there. The top row is just a bunch of predatory fishes that we did uh, were able to detect using environmental DNA. Particularly interesting are these salmon sharks. We never caught any in the net, but they were certainly there. We did get a few spiny dogfish and dagger tooth, but obviously there were more out there than what we caught in the nets. Also interesting are the marine mammals that we were able to detect uh, from this eDNA. We did see a few dolls porpoise and killer whales, uh, but there was clearly a lot more out there than what we, what we observed. Next. And I believe, yes, this is where we turn it back to Dick for kind of the implications of the study. Okay, well, I said that I would, um, I would talk about some highlights and I've got four of them. Um, one is on coho and three on sockeye. Um, I, I really need the next, well, first of all, this is, these, these are the distributions of coho. And if you look at 2020, and down uh, at the largest circle, that's going to be set number four. So well, the next, please. All right. Um, these are the DNA results, but I'm only talking about set four, which I, I referred to in the previous slide. Nope, I gotta go back to the table, that's it. And set four, uh, we caught, um, I can't remember now, 96 coho, and we have 52 of those coho analyzed for DNA. The remaining 44 are, are about to be done. But here's, here's the discovery, and it's, it's remarkable. There was no other fish caught in set four. And then we returned to this area a couple of weeks later and had three sets in the area without catching anything. No coho at all. So the interpretation is that this was one very large school that was moving around uh, in the survey area, but in the Gulf of Alaska. And if you look at the, the species or the stock composition, the, the stocks or populations within this school range from Oregon to Southeast Alaska. And there was even a Russian fish there that may or may not be correct depending on the baseline. But there is other evidence that, um, that indicates that there are, that coho form schools. In the proceedings of the virtual conference that we're publishing, we report some of these other, um, other schools that have been identified. When you see the science, there really is, is no doubt that this was an extremely large school that probably had, had maintained itself for weeks to months. And if you think about how this could possibly have formed, so all of these stocks have come from coastal areas over a wide range and then slowly aggregated into a large school. Almost impossible to believe. So, but, be, but there is other evidence that these large schools exist. And of course, that's too much to, the, to be presented today. But that's a, that's a really significant discovery that is going to completely change how we think about what coho do in the ocean. So the next slide. Okay, uh, I'm now gonna switch over to some discoveries uh, with sockeye. And here, you're looking at the total catches of pink and sockeye for the two expeditions, um, 124 sockeye, I think 167 pink salmon. 
And, they, and the discovery and the relevance is that you can see very clearly that there's very little overlap in the catches. And in Laurie's diet slides, um, I guess we should have pointed this out, but the diets of, of pink and sockeye in both expeditions were very similar. And so what you're seeing is a minimal overlap of sockeye and pink with a, almost identical diets. Um, and the relevance is that, as some of you know, there is a, there's been a, a number of papers written over the last probably 20 years that have proposed that fluctuations in abundance of sockeye salmon is related to interspecific competition with pink salmon and mainly based on the similarities of diets. So um, here you have, in the, and, and, and that similarity of diets is, comes from um, the proposal that the competition would occur in the winter. So here you have, I think for the first time, now this is only in the Gulf of Alaska, but still some of the published papers propose that this has occurred in the Gulf of Alaska. But uh, at least for these two years, minimal less than two per, less than ten percent overlap, similar diets, and clearly there is very little interspecific competition. So on to the next slide. Okay, um, these these next slides relate to the Canadian issue, and I, I in my introduction. I mentioned that the commercial catches of salmon in British Columbia are at uh, historic low levels. And sockeye in, in particular, and sockeye returns to the Fraser River. In my, as far as I'm concerned, they're catastrophically poor. So here you're looking at the Canadian catches and these are dispersed over a wide range. Now they, the stars indicate the Choco Lake sockeye, which are the dominant population that we have in the Fraser. Uh, again, just to show you the wide distribution, but it's the next slide that I wanna focus on. Okay, so these are uh, Ocean Age one uh, sockeye from both expeditions. There was a total of 35, uh, 16 of the 35 came from the Fraser River and about six of those came from Choco Lake. But when you look at the distribution, this, are, this is their first ocean winter. And some of you may know that, that we have for many years considered that the migration pattern of sockeye, they leave the, the natal rivers and fairly brief time in the coastal area, and then migrate northward in a counterclockwise um, movement up to around the Aleutian Islands, circle back, spend the winter in the Gulf of Alaska, the first winter, and then repeat that and spend the second winter in the Gulf of Alaska. Um, but what you see here, and I forgot to mention that, that the catches uh, over west of 180 degrees uh, longitude were from the Russian catches on their way over uh, to Vancouver prior to the beginning of the 2019 expedition. But what you're seeing here is a very wide distribution of sockeye salmon in their first ocean winter. And, and what we are, what Chris Neville and I are interpreting this to show is that this is a dispersion of, of, of juvenile sockeye rather than, it could be a, a whole series of loops, but this is a, this is a, um, a movement into, now there's an area obviously where we don't see anything because there was no surveys there, but the concept of a dispersion of juvenile sockeye in their first ocean year throughout this, this very large area is an indication that the energy that they need to accumulate to do this and to survive is, uh, is highly related 
to, it, we think will be highly related to their overall survival. So a completely different picture of where juvenile sockeye go in their first ocean year. And then one more slide next. And this is just to show you some of the same thing, but again, just to emphasize this time they, the purple triangles, and this was from 2020. These were three uh, ocean age, one juvenile sockeye that were identified as Russian origin. Now that could be a, um, a problem with the database, but even then, if that's, uh, that indicates the, the necessity to uh, improve that database, but that, if, if that turns, if those catches turn out to be correctly identified as Russian catches, look how far east that is compared to that red um, boundary that was supposed to be the boundary. And then I've already mentioned the Choco River, Choco Lake Sockeye, way to the west, that, um, that is what, about 4,000 kilometers uh, off the shore of British Columbia. So some extreme distributions that are new, and again, an indication that there's a lot more to understand about what regulates the survival of sockeye salmon once they enter the ocean. So next. Okay, I think this is me. Thanks, Dick. So I'll briefly speak to the 2022 International Year of the Salmon Pan Pacific High Seas Expedition. So the North Pacific Anatomist Fish Commission is planning this Pan Pacific Expedition to build on the 2019 and 2020 Gulf of Alaska expeditions that Lori and Dick were talking about. So this expedition is planned to go out in February and March of next year and will involve up to five vessels and the five countries uh, that were involved in the 2019 and 2020 expeditions as well. So if you'd like to learn more about this expedition, there's a lot of information uh, on our website and also uh, you can reference Mark Saunders, the IOS director's talk in the last seminar, who gave a brief overview of this expedition. May I, may I just interrupt you for a minute? Yes, go ahead. I, I'll just say that Brian Riddle and I now have, have raised the money and have the vessel uh, to also join this expedition and, and we will be doing long lining and gill netting or gill netting and long lining um, as a different way of, of catching salmon to compare to the catches in the trawls. But we have that money now, we have the ship and we're on our way. Great, thanks for adding that, Dick. So with that, if you have questions, I have Dick, Glory, and my email listed there. You can also find more information at the yearofthesalmon.org website. And we encourage you, if you're interested, to follow the International Salmon, International Year of the Salmon on social media to hear updates uh, as we plan and get ready for the 2022 expedition. So with that, we have a great group of panelists here today that are excited to talk to you about their experiences on the 2019 and 2020 Gulf of Alaska expeditions. And I'm excited to introduce them. So I will shop, stop sharing my screen here and I'll ask the panelists to turn their videos on. Great. Okay, thanks everyone. So I have some questions prepared for this discussion, but we're excited to hear your questions as well. So if you have a question about the presentation or something that comes up during the discussion here, please pop your questions into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and we will address those at the end of this discussion period. So I will start by asking the panelists to briefly introduce themselves, uh, where they're coming from and their involvement in 2019 and or 2020. So maybe Sabrina, I'll start with you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. 
My name is Sabrina Garcia, and I am a research biologist with the Alaska Department of Fish and Game based in Anchorage, Alaska. And my research focuses on juvenile salmon ecology in the northern and southern Bering Sea, and also on salmon shark migration and distribution. And I was lucky enough to be a participant on the 2020 Gulf of Alaska expedition. Great, thanks, Sabrina. Alexi? Hello, everyone. My name is Alexi Somov. I represent, represents, I represent Russia, uh, Pacific Fisheries Research Center. Um, I'm fisheries biologist and I study pelagic communities in Bering Sea with a specific interest to Pacific salmon. And I was a part of both expedition in 2019 and 2020. And in the last one, I, um, I helped uh, Christoph Dick to, or, uh, to lead this expedition. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alexi. Brian? Hi, everyone. Um, Brian Hunt. I'm an assistant professor at the Institute for Oceans and Fisheries at UBC, and I'm an ecosystem oceanographer. I was uh, lucky enough to be on the 2019 expedition, which was a real eye-opener for me. And uh, my lab was involved in 2020 and certainly looking forward to 2022, where we're doing a lot of work around food webs in the Gulf of Alaska as they relate to salmon. Thanks, Brian. And I know Dick and Laurie were already introduced, but maybe for those who joined a bit late, if you'd quickly introduce yourselves again. Dick, do you want to start? Uh, Dick Beamish. I retired in 2011, and I'm in my dining room at my house in, on Hammond Bay in Nanaimo. And I'm drinking a Bordeaux. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dick. Laurie? I'm Laurie. Yeah, I'm Lori Wakamp. I work for NOAA Fisheries, Northwest Fisheries Science Center. I was on the 19 expedition with uh, Brian and Alexi uh, and work on salmon and estuaries and oceans and now the high seas. And I'll be going out in 2022 on the Shimada. Great. Thanks, Lori. Okay, so my first question for the panelists is what was the most interesting or surprising thing that you saw during the 2019 and or 2020 expedition? And maybe I'll go around the virtual table for this one. So Brian, do you want to start us off? Sure, yeah, I, I think, uh... Well, I, I saw a lot of fascinating things, but the, the one thing that really blew my socks off was the, um, the um, huge biomass of jellyfish in the northern Gulf of Alaska, the northern half of the Gulf of Alaska. I, I predict Alexi would say that probably the same thing. Um, more than a million tons is estimated wet weight. Um, if you convert that to dry weight, still five times the biomass of, of salmon. So pretty incredible. Alexi, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I absolutely agree with Brian, uh, and I wanted to say the same. So we didn't mention it in the presentation, but in the northern part of uh, the study area in 2019, there was a huge uh, jellyfish bloom, and I even stood at the bridge and counted them, tried to try to count with them, and we uh, understood that there was million tons of them, and also, it was uh, quite hard to see a big picture in the expedition, but after uh, having all data collected from both expeditions, I understood how significantly different uh, distribution patterns and uh, condition of Pacific salmon uh, between Western and Eastern Pacific. And for me, it was a, a really interesting result because I had no idea before, before this expedition. Can you expand on that a little bit, Alexi? The differences between the Eastern and Western mm, The good example is the distribution of Pacific salmon. So Dick Beamish uh, mentioned that there was a clear separation in their distribution, specifically between pink salmon and sockeye salmon, but mainly it might be related because the suitable habitat in the Eastern in the eastern North Pacific is, is, is quite wide, it's quite wide. Uh, but in the western part is, is uh, comparably narrow, so it, it probably maybe 100 or maybe 200 miles from north to south. And this, uh, this area is quite 
very well mixed. There, uh, there is influence of Kurosho cr current. And there are a lot of uh, eddies and um, distribution of Pacific salmon. They are, they are mixed together. So uh, we, we can't see a clear separation of them. And so it, it is a main difference and it's quite interesting. Great, thanks, Alexi. Lori, do you have a comment? Um, I, as I mentioned in my talk, I mean, there was a lot of stuff that was really fascinating. Uh, one of the things that relates to what Dick was saying was just getting fish in a trawl that looked very different. Uh, for example, in 19, we got a lot of skinny chum salmon. And at the same time, in there'd be skinny chum in the, the net. At the same time, we'd have healthy looking chum that weren't skinny at all. And it's you know, where were you that you were obviously in different places before we caught you? Uh, where were those places? And, and just to see the variation in uh, the condition of, of fish out there was really, really fascinating, much more diverse than I thought it would be. Great. Thanks, Lori. And Sabrina, what would you say to this question? Um, for me, going into the survey, you know, we think of the Gulf of Alaska as, you know, the presumed overwintering grounds for many stocks of Pacific salmon. And I expected to encounter a lot more Pacific salmon than we did um, during the 2020 expedition. Um, one of the things that struck me was something that both Lori and Dick mentioned. Um, you know, going into this, we've had lots of, especially here in Alaska, a lot of talk about competition. And I was expecting to see more overlap between salmon species. Um, and we really didn't see that in 2020. Um, you know, more overlap between chum and pink, pink and sockeye, um, and that's not what we saw. So that, that to me was really interesting. Um, and, and also the lack of overlap between predators and prey. So in the 2020 survey, when we would do our evening trawls, we would get these, you know, huge masses of euphausids and so many different species of squid and mctophids, and we didn't see many salmon in those in those trawls, even though those are the things that we expect salmon to be, at least some species of salmon to be eating. Um, and along those same lines, while we did catch one dagger tooth when I was on the survey, which I was very excited about because we don't encounter those guys in the Bering Sea, so that was a, really exciting for me to see one of one of those, um, you know, we didn't encounter salmon sharks. And when we were in the wheelhouse transiting to stations, it wasn't like we were seeing huge, at least when, on, during my leg of the survey, you know, marine mammals that would be eating Pacific salmon. So those are just some of the things that stuck out to me. Great, thanks, Sabrina. And Dick, do you have an answer okay. to the question? One, one more quick one is that, um, I mentioned that the commercial catches in British Columbia of all salmon species were the lowest in history in 2019 and 2020. And those low catches, commercial catches extended into Southeast Alaska. And I think that we will find that we were out in the Gulf of Alaska doing those surveys in, in two years in which there was the lowest abundance of salmon probably in, in certainly in decades um, in, the, in the Gulf of Alaska. And we will then be able to relate that to things like the plankton and, and squid and, and jellyfish. And all of that remains to be done by somebody other than me. <laughs> Great, Dick, thank you. So to build on that answer a bit, I'm curious about what these expeditions can tell us about the likely response of salmon to climate change or whether we can make any inferences based on these two years um, or how in the future we might be able to make inferences, which is what Dick is speaking to a bit here, I think, in his last response. So I'll just open the floor if someone wants to take on that question. Brian Hunt to talk about that. <laughs> um, so it's tricky with two years of data uh, to be able to say much. So like one of the things that we, we really need to do is, is understand how the system responds to, to change. And that's why we need to go back. Um, and that's also why we need to really make a big effort to um, harness the uh, historic data so we can understand um, change over time. Um, 
But uh, I mean, one of the things that is worth um, that I think that's important to consider, like coming away from these expeditions, is you know building information about how the the fish are behaving at sea, uh, what they're feeding on. That gives us some ideas um, about where change might happen. So zooplankton is obviously very important in the diets. Uh, we saw there were particular species that were important. We know a lot about uh, some of these species, and so we could make uh, we can really start thinking about how zooplankton communities might change, and then you know think about the implications of this for the the health um, of salmon. You know, Dick was talking about the energetics, and um, there's a big dis uh, difference in, in in the energy content and nutritional value of these species, and so shifts in the in the composition can be could could have uh, serious implications then for the the uh, the health of the salmon. I think Brian brings up a really good point is that we have to take an ecosystem perspective. We can't just study salmon in a vacuum because climate change is not going to just affect salmon, but it's gonna affect so many parts of their ecosystem, right? Their prey, their predators, how they interact with their environment. So I think it's really important that these expeditions not only have the salmon biologists, but have the zooplankton biologists and the oceanographers to kind of put all these pieces together and, and find out you know, where are we going to see these changes and how are those changes going to trickle into, you know, salmon runs a few, the, few years down the line. An international team of researchers, right? Yep. <laughs> Great. Can I ask Go ahead. Go ahead, Alexi. Yeah, I, well, I just, uh, I agree with Brian Fan that uh, it's quite difficult to, uh, to see a big picture having only two data, two years of data, it's like uh, looking through a, like a key hole. But we have a huge historical data set and we can uh, make some comparisons with them. For example, we obviously detected uh, a distribution shift of Pacific salmon uh, compared to, um, to the previous, previous years to the north and northwestern part of Pacific Ocean. And it may be uh, worth uh, comparing you know, like um, condition of Pacific salmon between these uh, two data sets. Probably we'll see some difference between them. Great, thank you. Anyone else have something to add to this question? I'll, I'll pipe in. I think it's also important to think about uh, kind of why fish are distributed as they are. And, you know, are they going to certain places in the ocean because that's where they've always gone? Or are they responding to the conditions that they're finding there? Uh, even things as simple as temperature, you know, sockeye were in cooler waters. Is that typical of sockeye? Do they always want a particular temperature preference and that's what they're looking for? Or is it prey or is it location? Um, and I think really trying to understand those drivers is really important to help understand what's going to happen in the future as the ocean gets warmer and the prey base changes. So what is really driving their distributions? Thanks, Laurie. So we have some good questions coming in, so I want to save enough time for that and feel free if anyone else has questions to put them in the chat or put them in the Q&A now. But I'll ask one last question that I think some of you have alluded to in your other responses. And that is, what is one of the biggest questions that you still have after the 2019 and 2020 expeditions? And maybe if you could speak to how this might be addressed in the future by 2022 and onwards, um, that would be interesting as well. Who wants to open it on this one? I can, I can, uh, Sabrina, <laughs> go for it. You were going to talk. <laughs> I was, yeah, I, was going, um, I guess I have a few big questions. Um, my biggest question is, where is the bottleneck happening in salmon's life stage that's leading to the population run, run sizes that we're seeing, um, not only in BC, but in Alaska and Russia and Japan. Um, I think it's really important if we can identify the life stage where the problem is occurring. Um, and previous research was saying, you know, this is happening somewhere really early in the life stage of the salmon. Um, but maybe we're starting with with you know these really big climate events that we've seen in the last few years, maybe we're starting to see that maybe that's not the case anymore. 
And if we can figure out where the bottleneck is, we can start to focus our efforts in identifying where the problem is and try to find some solutions. Um, I'm also really interested in the question of inter and intraspecific competition. So where are these species overlapping? Not only when in the ocean, but where? And it might happen across different, like at different ages, like maybe a chum salmon is going to com compete with a salmon, with a sockeye salmon that's, you know, in a second year in the ocean and trying to figure out when and where that overlap is happening. Um, and that may signal, you know, is competition a, a driving factor in salmon productivity? And, and for me, another one would be a big one is how wild and hatchery raised salmon are interacting in the marine environment. I think that's a big one. Um, you know, are we seeing wild and hatchery raised chum salmon in the same areas? Are we are they eating the same things? Are they growing the same way? Um, th that was a really interesting point that Lori brought up earlier where we have these trawls where we have such um, different looking chum salmon and, and why are we seeing fish in such different conditions? Um, yeah, so those are just a few of my, my big questions. Looking forward to seeing, to answering those in this February. Thanks, Serena. Alexi? Yes, thanks. For me, it also the most interesting question uh, for 2020 expedition is to understand how severe winter condition for salmon survival. So, um, because um, we often relate some inconsistencies uh, with salmon forecasting that if uh, we have low returns, we, all, we often relate it to winter condition that something happened with them in the ocean without any clear evidence and uh, the main goal of this expedition is to shed light on this question. So how severe uh, winter condition for them. Thanks. Brian, go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, I have a few sort of interconnected components that we've, we, we kind of touched on from a, like a temporal aspect. I want to know what the salmon are doing outside of February, March, um, where are they distributed? And, um, and obviously to extend the time series, I mean, I'm intrigued to see the next year and the next year just to start to really build up an impression of how fish are responding to conditions. From a spatial component, um, I, was, I, I think that we, we all became fascinated with the, the heterogeneity. So this is not just one place. Um, there are some interesting dynamics. There are things like, you know, eddies and fronts and, and uh, uh, continental slopes where there are particular features. How are the fish using these features? And how are animals distributed vertically? So what is the behavior of the fish and in interacting with uh, the, the zooplankton distributions? And those are important things to understand when we're thinking about climate change, like uh, decreasing oxygen levels from the, from the bottom, ocean acidification, surface warming, it all affects distributions of animals. And then the interactions, um, predators, like we saw evidence of, you know, predation marks on fish. We didn't catch many predators, but we had some insight into that of eDNA. So we need to know more about that. Like what is the predation that's going on on the high seas? And then the competition, not just salmon, but with other species that are eating zooplankton. So the squid and the mctophids that are in competition with the salmon for prey. I think those would be the, the big ones that, that, that popped out for me. Thanks, Brian. Dick, do you have any comments? I am specifically interested in the why coho form large schools. And I suspect that it might be the equivalent of, of, of hibernation and that, that coho are feeding only enough to maintain metabolic requirements. Because I looked at all of the scales that were collected in both expeditions and there's virtually no period that the rapid growth doesn't start until March. I don't think those, I don't think scales have been available to anyone um, in, from February, March before. So I think that's a possibility. And that's what I'd like to look at if I can get some scales from 2022. Great. And Laurie? Um as a salmon biologist, I think the distribution of salmon across the North Pacific is really fascinating on a stock specific level. As, as Dick showed in his talk, uh, you know, the Choco Lake soccer are way farther west than ever, anybody ever thought. And with genetic 
techniques that we can do today where we can identify individual fish to their stream of origin, um, it's completely changed our ability to understand where these fish are from. And I, I think that's really fascinating because we really don't know where they are. Um, I've seen some questions in the uh, Q&A about the skinny chum that I mentioned in 2019. And Yurawa-san uh, has a talk on that. Um, and it turns out it's salmon from all different stocks. I think Western Alaska was the only chum salmon that didn't show uh, skinny fish. And there were also ocean age twos and threes, not ocean age ones, which is what you might think that the smaller fish ocean age ones you know, just don't have the metabolic inertia to make it through the winter, but in fact, it was the twos and threes, but it was from, uh, you know, I think Oregon all the way to, to Russia that the, the chum salmon were skinny and, and some of the Jap Japanese fish as well. So it's really, really fascinating. It wasn't any particular stock. It was ever, all of the ocean age twos and threes. Great, thanks for answering that question. Yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, do you have a comment? Mm -hmm. Yes. I, I just thought probably it might be related to a uh, very large distance they have to migrate during their ocean phase. phase. I mean, Russian and Japanese stocks of chum salmon because they have to move from Asian uh, coast, firstly to Bering Sea or during their first age of, of during their first ocean age and then move back and forth between Gulf of Alaska and Bering Sea and these distances. Are, quite large. Probably it, it was just a beginning of their their uh, feeding. And they moved to Gulf of Alaska and start feeding, start gaining their, their uh, weight. And we just detected this period of, of beginning. Thanks, that's an interesting thought, Alexi. So with that, I will move into the questions that the audience has. There are quite a few, so we'll see how many we can get through. Um, the first from Risa, squid seem to be highly abundant in both trawls and diets of salmon. Any insight into the different squid species and regions of origin? Does anyone want to tackle that question? Squid is a Russian question. We're not North Americans. I'm not very good at identifying them. I think in, in 19, we had 13 species of squid uh, that we detected. Most of them are gonadid squids or hook arm squids. Um, and as far as mctophids, in 19, and I know if Vladimir is on the line, he can talk about this, but most of them were actually blue lantern fish, um, which was really surprising that there wasn't greater diversity. I think we had I don't know, Alexa, do you remember how many species of mctophids yeah, you got? Yes, that's absolutely few. correct. Blue lanternfish was the most abundant uh, mctophid species during both years. And it is quite unusual because uh, comparing historical, comparing to our articles, historical articles, we thought that uh, stenobrachios must be the most abundant species in the, the whole North Pacific. A complete shift in the abundance of the two of the dominant mctophids, and so the blue lantern fish or Tarleton beanie cranularis being so abundant um, in the Strait of Georgia, we call them rare. Um, so that is a was a remarkable discovery. If, if Fred Chenko's on the line, he wrote a paper about this. Yeah, Vladimir. Well, we recently published a paper and Vladimir Rachenko was the leader of this paper. And, and there we consider uh, stenobrachios migration patterns during their uh, life cycle. And probably it might be related to seasonal cycle because uh, during that time of year, the uh, young, young stenobrachios might be transported to Bering Sea. And that's why there was not, not, much, not many of them during this period. Probably. But go back to squid for a minute. The squid, I think, are, are, are going to be one of the, the keys to understanding what's affecting salmon in the Gulf of Alaska. And uh, I, we, had, we, have, uh, we have Russian scientists and one, um, we had our, a Canadian biologist that was good too. But in general, up until these expeditions, I don't think that we, 
we paid a lot of attention to identifying squid either in, in terms of catches or in terms of um, diet items, but I'm, I may be wrong. Brian, what do you think? Uh, I think I agree with you. Great, okay, I wanna have time to answer a few more questions, so I'll move us on here. Uh, a question from Christoph with 2019 and 2020 having exceptionally low returns, do you expect higher catches for 2022? And where are the pinks? <laughs> Who wants to take on that question? <laughs> They're in Calgary. <laughs> in Juneau. Nobody, we don't know. That was a huge surprise. For 2019, I estimated how many pink we would catch. And then we bought Floyd tags to, to tie around the peduncle. And I was something like 5,000 to 10,000 more tags than I was supposed to buy. So no predictions for 2022? Who knows? Tell us, tell us, Christoph, tell us how many fish are going to return in 2022, and then we'll tell you how many we're going to catch. <laughs> <laughs> I think the quit that squid or the pink question is really huge, though. I mean, if we had continued sampling further south, would we run up into more pinks? Uh, unfortunately, the genetics isn't great for the pink salmon. So we don't have a really good sense of where the ones that we did catch were coming from. Um, Gulf of Alaska odd year in 2019 is what it what it what they show up as genetically. But it it, it is a huge question because pinks are by far the most abundant salmon in the North Pacific. And where were they? Lexi, where do you think the pink were? I think they were to the south. All evidence uh, suggested that they were to the south. But are they, are they but interesting thing that that on the way back during 2019, we uh, did some trolls to the south to the south of our uh, original station grid, but we didn't catch any pink salmon. Probably it might be related because we were too far not too, too far south. It was about uh, 200 miles south to our original. Greed. And it might be related that they probably might start to migrate uh, shoreward. So think about how this is going to change the science in, uh, that we have in North America. If, if pink or even the, the distribution that we saw, they were um, south there was, and, and sockeye north. But if pink were even farther south, what is that going to say? about all of our theories about species interactions or hatchery pink. The, 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 the implications are huge. They're, they're a, another example of why everybody should be encouraging more of these expeditions. Thanks for that plug, Dick. <clears throat> so one more question here. Are Pacific salmon maturing earlier in rivers in the Pacific due to warming waters like they are in the Atlantic and going to sea earlier before they've grown to proper size so are compromised before they even head out into the ocean? I think generally not. Um, there's some evidence that a few runs are actually returning earlier. Uh, but I, I know Columbia River sockeye salmon is one of those that is slowly coming in sooner and sooner, uh, the adults. But I, I don't think that the situation you see with Atlantic salmon, um, where they're getting these cues in freshwater to go out to the ocean sooner than they really should, uh, seem to exist for Pacific salmon. Certainly we've had with these heat waves or heat domes, we've had a lot of die-offs in rivers in Alaska and the Fraser and the Columbia for fish that are coming in right at the wrong time when, when it's hot. Um, but I don't think the situation with Pacific salmon is quite what it is with the Atlantics uh, as far as their run timing changes, both going downstream and upstream. Does anyone else want to comment on that? Alexi, what do you see in Russia? Do you think the timing is changing? 
it's hard to say. I agree, uh, in general, I agree with you that there is some evidence, but without any dramatical changes of uh, of this. So, I mean, the, of age of maturity and the size of migration, but we have some evidence and uh, we need to study it more carefully in the future. Great. Okay, uh, we have a few more questions, but we are out of time here. Uh, you can reach out to me if you want your question answered and I can put you in touch with the correct person. And I think uh, I will conclude it here. So I wanna thank the panelists for taking the time to uh, present and answer questions today. Uh, I definitely learned a lot and we do have, we are continuing this IYS seminar series. So Aiden will uh, put the preview for the next seminar on the screen here. You can register at yearofthesalmon.org slash seminar. You can register for the full series or you can register for individual seminars. So the next one, although it says TVD on here, the actual date is October 13th from four to 5 p.m. And we'll be talking about autonomous vehicles in high seas research. So thank you everyone for coming today. Hopefully we'll see you next time.